It's Easter. There you go. Hey, I am so, so glad to have you with us this morning. In fact, we're really glad. We're so glad we're going to give you a gift just because it's Easter Sunday. So ushers are coming around. They're passing that out. You can just hold on to it. We'll talk about it later on in the service. Hope you uh, found your way to a parking space and a donut or six, a cup of coffee or six, you know. But uh, uh, if you're a guest, let me say a special welcome to you. Really, really glad to have you with us. It takes a certain amount of courage to go into a place for the first time. And so really, really glad that you're here. I want you to have a great experience. And part of that experience involves this green card that I'm holding in my hand. We call it the connection card. If you grab out of the seat back in front of you, you should find a connection card. And you could just uh, scan that QR code, and you'll find out about all kinds of things that we've got going on here every single week. Every single week, we've got uh, opportunities for single moms to gather together, support one another. We got opportunities for college students to gather together, form relationships. We got opportunities for veterans to uh, support each other in a way that only veterans can. We've got an opportunity we call Celebrate Recovery for people who are uh, working through addiction process. Yeah, so all kinds of things happening every single week. And you can all find out about all of them right through this, uh, this QR code or on our website. I want to let you know about a couple of things that are coming up, some special opportunities. And one is a men's conference, a men's conference coming up in just a couple of weeks, Saturday, April 13th. And we're calling it Obstacle Course because I don't know if you're like me and you feel like sometimes your life is like an obstacle course and you just butt up against all kinds of different challenges at home, at work, uh, with your family, your friendships, all those kinds of things. Well, we're going to talk about all that stuff. It's going to be a really, really helpful time. It's going to be fun. There's games. There's prizes. There's a barbecue lunch that's going to really uh, hit the spot. We got a guest speaker, some breakout sessions. It's all happening on April 13th, just a couple of weeks. You can sign up on our website. You can hit the same QR code and find out more information about that. One other thing I want to let you know about is something that we're calling the Sanctuary Course. And the Sanctuary Course is for people who uh, struggle with mental health issues or people who know or who are connected to someone who's struggling with mental health issues. Because we want the church to be a safe place, a supportive place, a place where you can feel a sense of belonging. And so if you uh, have somebody in your life who's got some mental health challenges, or if you're that person who's got some mental health challenges, I want you to take special notice of this sanctuary course. It's starting in just a couple of Sundays from now, and you can find out more information. You can sign up on our website there. It's going to be a really, really helpful and encouraging thing. So those are some things that are going on. Uh, I'm going to pray for us, and we're going to continue on with our service. Let's pray. God, we just are, are grateful for what you've done. For us, you, you took on uh, the one enemy that we all have in common, death, and you conquered it for us. And we're grateful. We praise you this morning. We pray that you would uh, use this time that we've gathered together to encourage us, to challenge us, to equip us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, happy Easter, everybody. Happy. Okay, great to see all of you today. Hey, this is, I think this is my favorite uh, a Sunday in church, Easter Sunday. I get real excited about that, but... You know, it's not like you don't know what I'm going to talk about, right? So, so you kind of got that down. And I know why some of you only come at Christmas and Easter. You think, oh my gosh, Steve only has two sermons. And he just repeat, 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 you know, just the same things. But I really enjoy Easter because I want you, some of you have been window shopping Jesus and you're kind of kicking the tires of this thing called Christianity and following Jesus. And the reason I like Easter so much is that I want you to consider trusting him today as your savior. I want you to consider inviting him into your life. And at the end of this message, I'm going to give you the opportunity to do that. Okay. So that's where we're headed today. Now, oh, did we hand out these? Did everybody get one of these, these little stickers? Everybody got, got one? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Just hang on to those. And at, at the end, I'm going to tell you what we're going to do with those because it's part of the message today as well. So some of you maybe have been thinking about following Jesus and you're thinking about how do I seal the deal? How do I really get there? I, I'm, I went to a class or I've been coming to church a little bit or I went to church growing up or somebody was telling me about it and I watched some, something on YouTube and I listened to podcasts. I just want to know how to get there. So we're going to talk about that today. But others of you, you got your arms crossed and you're going, 
uh-uh, not me today. And I understand that, I understand that, because the only reason you came is because your mother promised you lunch after church, so, so, right, right, am I right, right? So, or your girlfriend said, I want to go to church today, and you go, I'll go anywhere with you. Church, yeah, I'll even go, and you're like, oh, no, you know, so, so you're here. You know, I get it, I get it. So, because I think at Easter, as we talk about the resurrection of Jesus, I think it just kind of does an end run around all of our objections and concerns about following Jesus. For some of you, you know, the reason that you're not a Christian is because you know some Christians. <laughs> yeah, you know some, right? And you think, oh, they're just a bunch of hypocrites. And, and I get that. Or your boss is a Christian and he's harsh. Or, uh, or, or somebody in your family's a Christian. Or I send you stuff and you're tired of it. And you just got all that going on. You say, man, it's just, I'm, I'm hitting the brakes, Steve. I'm hitting the brakes and all this. Or for some of you, you know, you've had a bad experience at a, in a church setting or something like that. And you have some, some hurts about that. For others of you, it's something different, like maybe, maybe your mom was a believer and she got cancer and you prayed and she still died and you just got doubts about how good God and all that fits together. So you got those doubts and things, and, but I think it's a Sunday where when we talk about the resurrection and we talk about Easter, it just kind of does an end run about that and we get to the really heart of the matter. So we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about Easter today and why it is uh, uh, so important. Uh, and that's why I want to bring it up today. For some of you, I was thinking about this, that you went to college and you took a class and they said the whole thing's a myth and a legend and your whole world imploded, right? And so, and so it can just be a chance at Easter for you to reconnect with God. So if you're taking Taking notes in one of these things that we handed out, point number one is just simply this. The foundation of the Christian faith is the resurrection of Jesus. It's the resurrection of Jesus. It's not the parables Jesus told, although I love the parables. It's not the teaching that he had, although I, I always preach from the Bible. But it's the person of Jesus. Jesus himself is the center of everything. And the resurrection is the center and the foundation of Christianity. The foundation is not the behavior of other Christians. You know, it's not those things because then we'd all be in trouble, right? Right, right? But the foundation of the Christian faith is the resurrection of Jesus. Historians tell me that the very, that Jesus is the hinge of all history. Every time you date a document, you're referencing the life of Jesus Christ, his birth, and all the way to his resurrection. And so he's the hinge of history. He's the center of everything. But the weird thing is, in the first century, Jesus was not the most well-known person. The most well-known person in the first century was a guy named Nero. Have you ever heard of Nero? You know, Nero was that emperor of Rome, and he's famous for fiddling while Rome burned. Or maybe you heard about him because he threw Christians to the lions. But, but Nero was super popular and famous in the first century, and hardly anybody knew anything about Jesus. And today, we hardly know anything about Nero. That's all we know about him. But people know a lot about Jesus, okay? Today, all across the world, a billion people will be going to a church service. That's a lot. A billion people. And you know what? Hardly anybody remembers the Roman Empire or anything else from the first century. But we got our handle upon Jesus because he is the foundation. He is the hinge of history. I was watching a show on Napoleon, and he had more battlefield uh, wins than any other general in all of history, but he's not the hinge of history. Taylor Swift <laughs> is not the hinge of history, okay? Might be the hinge of your week, I don't know, but anyway, so... But Jesus and the resurrection is the hinge of all history, and the crazy thing is this. I want you to think about it. In the first century after Jesus was crucified and he came back to life and his followers started talking about it, the Roman Empire and other authorities tried to stomp it out. They said, we don't want this. And they're trying to, you know, keep it away and stop it. And, and as hard as they tried, as hard as they tried, today a billion people are going to church today somewhere. And the question is, how did that happen? How did it happen that there's no more Roman Empire, but we got a billion Christians going to church? And the answer is, the explanation is, is simply the resurrection. Jesus did not come to start 
you know, like a new government, like to overthrow the Roman government or to cause an insurrection. And in fact, at one time, they're trying to trick him into this political thing, and they asked Jesus a question about politics, and he said this, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and give to God what is God's. And everybody walked away and goes, that's brilliant. That's brilliant, right? So Jesus was not trying to cause an upheaval in the Roman Empire, but yet, yet it happened. In fact, Jesus was questioned by Pilate, and Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this, do you know what the next word is? Not of this world. Say it with me. My kingdom is not of this world, world. So Jesus is telling Pilate, hey, you have nothing to be threatened about because my kingdom is not of this world. So Jesus is the hinge of all history. So what I want to do is I want to give you the, uh, let me give you the story of Easter, the 20,000 foot view. Okay, so here it is. Jesus started uh, preaching and doing miracles and gathering big crowds. And the miracles he was doing was big time miracles. Like you didn't have a leg, your leg grew back. Like, like you'd been, you were quadriplegic, quadriplegic, and then all of a sudden, all your muscles came back, and you jumped up, and you were blind. You didn't even have any eyes. All of a sudden, you could see. I mean, this is the miraculous happening. And crowds started following him, and he was teaching. And then he started saying stuff like this. If you believe in me, all your sins are forgiven, and you can go to heaven. Well, that got everybody's attention right there because he's claiming to be God. That's amazing. And so the political authorities and the people in the capital were like, we got to do away with this guy. This movement is going nowhere, okay? And so he's doing miracle after miracle and making this claim about um, uh, forgiving sins. And so they arrested Jesus on a Thursday. And then he was interrogated six times. We call those interrogation courts and all within about six hours. And he went three to the Roman government, three times to Jewish authorities. And, and then Pilate said, okay, we're going to execute you. And they took him and beat him within an inch of his life and they flogged him. So in the first century, a flogging meant you were whipped 26 times across the back, 13 times across the chest. The whips were made out of stone and glass and it ripped the skin off the bone in the first century, they had terms like this. When a person was flogged, they were filleted to the bone like a fish. And so Jesus was beaten. And then he was hung on a cross. And that was the public form of execution. And then they threw a spear in him to make sure he was dead. And uh, Jesus died on Friday. Now then, two people took his body and put it into a tomb. And they put a 2,000-pound rock in front of it. And then they guarded it with Roman soldiers. And then three days later, Jesus came back to life. And everybody who was a coward and ran away all of a sudden became a believer. Now, that's the 20,000-foot view of the, of, the, um, of the Easter story. I did a little research this week, and I was, I was researching dead bodies. <laughs> I, I don't want to ruin your lunch, okay? But anyway, so... <laughs> So about an hour after, after a body dies, there will be insects, especially out in the open like Jesus was. And then within three days, there's eggs and maggots. So I want you to think about this. Jesus was not, not mostly dead. He was really dead. And then he came back to life. That is a miracle. Well, Let's get into some details here. And Jesus was with his disciples, and he asked them a question one day, who do people say that I am? And in Matthew 16, we read this. But what about you, he asked, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you're the Messiah. That's, that's a Jewish term that means savior of the world. And put it that way. The son of the living God. And Jesus replied, look at this, how he replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. I want you to notice something. When he asked the question, Jesus says, you are the, the son of the living God. Jesus didn't go, whoa, hang on there, Peter. That's a little too much. You're going to give me a swelled head. Jesus didn't say that. He didn't, he go, hold on, hold on. Back the train up, fellas. No, no, no. He goes, he goes, bazinga. He goes, bingo, Peter. 
And furthermore, you didn't come up with that on your own. God told you that. God told you that. So all of a sudden, they're in this place called Caesarea Philippi. It's named after, this is where this event took place. It's named after Caesar. And, and they're acknowledging that Jesus seems to be, the, uh, to be the Son of God, the Savior, the Messiah of the world. You know, Jesus started his public, getting into the public eye around the Jordan River and a man named John the Baptist. And this is what happens when Jesus walked into the public spectrum John the Baptist said this in John 1, 20, and the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God. What does that mean? First century in the Jewish community, they would take lambs and they would slaughter them in the temple mount in Jerusalem. And that was to signify that their sins had been forgiven and removed. And so when John the Baptist sees Jesus, he says, that's the one. He's the one. Now notice he didn't say, he's the one that will help you do really well in your NCAA bracket. I could have used some help with that. Oh, my gosh. But what does he say? He goes, takes away the sin of the world. Takes away the sin of the world. If you're taking notes, this leads me right to number two. The death atones for my sin. The death of Jesus atones for our sins. Okay. I think somewhere deep inside every person in this room is an awareness that when we do something immoral, we have bad behavior, that there's consequences for that bad behavior. When someone commits a crime... When somebody walks into school and shoots it up, we say this, somebody's got to pay for something. When somebody kidnaps a child, abuses a child, we say somebody's got to pay for that. When something horrible like that happens, we say somebody's got to pay for that. When you get a speeding ticket, somebody's got to pay. You have to pay for that. It's a minor thing, right? But when we see these serious things, we go, oh my goodness, somebody has to pay because when we violate the law like that, if somebody does that and you go, well, oops, my bad. He says, well, I just didn't cut it. Just didn't cut it. You shot up a school. You did this. Those sorry excuses. Cheated on your spouse. You cheated at your work. You cheated your employer. You acted with selfishness and pride and ego, and you lied. You lied to your parents. You stole from your parents. You have an anger problem. You blew up. You pushed. You shoved. You hit. You screamed. You told somebody you hated them. This week you thought about, I wish they were dead. You say, well, I would, never, I would never do that. But you thought about it. It all adds up. It all adds up to a moral debt that you cannot pay. And here's the thing. Jesus had to pay because you can't pay for it on your own. That's, that's the whole reason Jesus died. You say, well, why can't I pay for it on my own? Because, because God is holy and perfect, 100% perfect. God is perfect. So my imperfect attempts won't cut it. I cannot behave my way into perfection. Besides, you'd be asking the question all the time, how good do you have to be? And you will never know because you'll have to be perfect. Jesus paid it for you. He is the perfect atonement for our sins. I mean, every culture, every country, every language, every tribe for centuries have had some type of atonement awareness deep inside of them. That's what, that's what we have. The atonement, the word atonement means making amends or payment for the offenses committed. Years ago, I was in um, Southeast Asia. I was teaching a pastor's conference. And we're in a marketplace where they're selling food and all kinds of stuff. And walk by and there's a guy with a cage selling sparrows. Oh, what is that? <laughs> And my guide is with me, translator, and he goes, well, they're selling these birds. It's uh, this and this kind of thing. And I said, well, let's go talk to the guy. And so we're in a conversation. Well, why are you selling birds? And the guy explains that you buy a bird, and you put it in your hand. It's a little sparrow. And then you let it go, and it takes your sins away from you, and you have no more sins. I said, is it one bird per sin? <laughs> the guy looked at me like... Phew. It's nonsense. Anyway, so I said, well, we need bigger birds. You know, that's what I said, too. <laughs> so my buddy is with me. He goes, how much? 
So uh, we negotiated. <laughs> Everything's negotiable there. Got it down to a dollar. <laughs> dollar. And uh, so he buys a bird, and he puts it in his hands like this. My friend Charlie, who preached here a couple years ago, and he's got it in his hand, and he goes, okay, I'm getting ready to let it go. And he does this. The bird bit him and then flew off. <laughs> I said, man, you got a lot of sin in your life, buddy. <laughs> That's, like, get it out of you, right? <laughs> but still, what do you do? What do you do with that moral mountain of debt that you have? Because you can't pay it. You can't pay it. Hey, let's just think of it this way. That, um, let's just say that I own a Ferrari. And just not any Ferrari. I own an unlimited edition there's no other Ferrari like it in the world, and it cost me $1.5 million. You know it's hypothetical, right? <laughs> Do you know it's hypothetical? Hypothetical? Because I'm not one of those kind of pastors. Anyway, so I don't have that kind of money. So, uh, but I have a, a $1.5 million Ferrari in my driveway, and then one of you steal it. Let's just say this guy steals it. <laughs> this guy in the front row, he steals it. At 2 a.m. in the morning, he comes to my house because I think he knows where I live. So he comes to my house. He, he steals my Ferrari. This guy, this guy right here, I'm not going to tell you. I'll just give you his initials, Christian. So that's his name So, because that is his name. So anyway, he steals my Ferrari, and he hops in it, and he drives in, and he gets on Delta Highway, and he's going 120 miles an hour down Delta Highway, screaming fast. Takes the exit, gets on Beltline. He's headed to I-5. He takes it, and he's going south toward Creswell Cottage Grove. He's up to 175 miles an hour in my bright red, one-of-a-kind, $1.5 million Ferrari. He gets to the exit. He slows down. He loses control, and he totals because he's not good with a stick shift. <laughs> <laughs> he totals my car. He to yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> He totals my car. <laughs> totals my car. So we got some options here. So we can develop a payment plan for $1.5 million because he doesn't have insurance. <laughs> then, yes, he doesn't have insurance. So what's going to happen? So, you know, the payment plan, he's going to be paying for eternity. $1.5 million. The other option is I could just forgive it. I could forgive that. Now that would be at great cost to me, but it would be free to him, right? And the day that Jesus hung on that cross and he died and he came back to life, he paid what you owe for free. But it came at great cost to Jesus because he had to absorb the cost of it all. And that's what we call an atonement. An atonement. Whenever Jesus talked about things, he was very deliberate and he talked about himself a lot. If you read through the New Testament, you see that he talks a lot about himself. He talks about, he talks in parables, but the parables are often about himself. All the illustrations are about himself, how he is the savior of the world. He's trying to communicate to people about himself. He is the one, the Messiah, the one that can take away your sin. He is the one that can give you eternal life as well. So Jesus was the center of everything he talked about. One day, Jesus was with his disciples and somebody comes to him and, and says, hey, your best friend Lazarus, he's about to die. You need to go see him. And Jesus says, nah, we're going to wait. We're going to wait until he's dead. And I can just see the disciples, they're trying to tell this story, right? Right? They're trying to tell the story. They're writing it later on. He goes, should we include this in this story? Because Jesus looks bad. <laughs> he's going to wait four days? Are you going to wait until Mary and Martha are heartbroken and bawling their eyes out before you show up? Are you going to wait that long? Are you going to wait? Until they're grief-stricken and so broken. 
So Jesus waits four days. They're heartbroken, and he shows up. And in John eleven twenty one, 21, it says this, Lord, Martha says to him, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. You know what he's saying? You didn't show up on time. You're late. And furthermore, Jesus, you're making it really hard for us to believe in you because you're late. You're making it really hard on us. We don't understand if you're good and you didn't show up and we just don't get this. And Jesus could have said, you know, Martha and Mary, I just want to explain to you what happens after a person dies. And I have a 38-point PowerPoint thing to give you. And then you can share it with your children and your grandchildren for 2,000 years. People can know what happens after you die and so forth. And no, he didn't say that. Look what he says. I am the resurrection and the life. He immediately comes back to his own self. He's pointing back to himself. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes, believes in me. Not in my parables, not in the cool stories they tell, but in me. In me. In fact, 98 times in the book of John, it says, in me, believe in me. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And then he asks this profound question. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? It's a good question for you. Do you believe this? And maybe here's another question. Why would you believe this? Why would you believe this? Well, that's because Jesus backed it up with miracle after miracle after miracle, proving that his words are true. And the ultimate miracle is the resurrection from the dead. This is point number three. The resurrection is evidence of Jesus' claim. So he claims to be the Son of God. He claims to give people eternal life. He claims to give people forgiveness, which we desperately need. Our souls ache for forgiveness. So when Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life, he backs it up by believing, by becoming the ultimate person coming back from the dead. In fact, Jesus even predicted it in Matthew chapter 20. It says this, now Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. On the way, he took the 12 aside and said to them, we're going up to Jerusalem. Everybody went up to Jerusalem, by the way. It's on a hill. So, And the Son of Man, Son of Man, for those of you who don't know, is um, kind of a Jewish code word for Messiah, Savior. So they have clearly understood that you may not. The Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death. will hand him over to the Gentiles, that'd be the Romans, to be mocked, flogged, that's that whipping, and crucified. On the third day, he will be raised back to life. Holy cow. It's really funny if you, well, not funny, but right after this, they ask, can we sit on your right and your left? I said, so, it's so insensitive of them. Hey, I'm going to die, and then you want to be vice president, you know, so that's what they're saying. Jesus was trying to explain to them, hey, I'm going to this cross to die, and I'm going to come back to life. And they're struggling with this. They don't quite get it. And at one point, Jesus said, you know, I'm going away. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going away. I'm going away to prepare a place for you. And he says, well, where? And he goes, well, you don't know the way. Well, show us the way. And he goes, well, I am the way, Jesus says. And they're very confused. They got Jesus coming and going, and he's here and there, and they don't know the way, and very confused. And in one moment, one of the disciples, Philip, goes, hold on, Jesus. We don't get it. You're so confusing to us. And Philip says this, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. And Jesus doesn't say, well, let me tell you another parable. Let me tell you another story. Look at his response. Don't you know me? Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? How can you you say that? This is critically important for some of you because you've ghosted Jesus. You've ghosted him. You say, I don't understand. Ghosting is like this. I text you, you don't respond. I call you, you don't call me back. I send you an email, you don't email me back. You, you ghosted me. And for some of you in the room, you've ghosted Jesus. Oh, once in a while you throw a prayer up, 
but really, do you ever let him talk to you through scripture? You're, you're, you say you're a follower of Jesus and you never ever read your Bible? What's up with that? And do you ever talk to Jesus? Have a conversation with him? Have you ghosted him? So Easter is the perfect time. It's such a perfect time for you to reconnect with Jesus. It's such a perfect time. And today might be the day for many of you to reconnect with Jesus. But he kept talking about himself all the time. Hey, I'm going to the cross. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to come back to life. Jesus goes to the cross. He gets crucified. Everybody abandoned him. They all ran away. All his followers, they all ditched him. They all ran off. The very people said, hey, I'm going to be there forever were cowards. They were cowards. I know this... Here's one of the reasons I'm so convinced that the Bible's reliable and true because the very people who tell us about Jesus are the people who call themselves cowards all through the Bible. Because they all left. Hey, should we put in the part where we're cowards? Why would you? You see, if you were writing up a, a fictional story, you would never write yourself in as the coward. You ever watch Saving Private Ryan? You'd write yourself in as Tom Hanks. <laughs> Not the guy who's a coward who won't fight. You know, you're never going to do that. They're showing their humanness and their reliability. Yeah, yeah. So everybody who is following Jesus, as soon as he gets arrested, they are the very ones who's running, running, running away. In fact, a middle school girl schooled the apostle Peter. In Mark 14, it says this. Again, he denied it. And this is going to be a young woman. She says, after a little while, those standing near said to Peter, surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. So his accent gives him away. Peter, he began to call down curses, and he cussed them out and said, I don't even know who this man you're talking about. Peter runs off. They're all cowards at this point. And you know why? Because they think they arrested Jesus, they're going to kill Jesus, and they're coming for us next. Yeah, they're coming for me next. They're going to round us up. They're trying to stamp this out. They're going to kill us next. They're scared. I don't blame them. I get it. I get it. There were no followers of Jesus after the crucifixion because they're all running away and hiding. Maybe some of you are running away and hiding today. I don't know. But Jesus says, I am the resurrection and life. And the reason this is so important is because messiahs don't die. The son of God doesn't die. That was a foreign concept to them. They're like, oh, I, I can't get it. Here's what happens next to the story. Taking Jesus' body down, John 19 uh, body, uh, the two of them, there would be two guys named Nicodemus and Joseph. That were their names. We know that from other Gospels. They wrapped his body in spices and strips and linen. This was in accordance with the Jewish burial customs. And so they hurried to get Jesus' body off the cross because of the uh, Sabbath. You're not supposed to be walking around. And they put it in a tomb, and they rolled this big rock in front of it. And the rock, by the way, weighs about 2,000 pounds. It's a ton. And so on Sunday, some women said... The men prepared Jesus' body, and we know they messed it up because they're men. <laughs> and so they go and correct it, right? They go, they messed it up. They were in a hurry. They don't know what they're doing. And so several women come to the, to the grave, to the tomb, early Sunday morning, because it's still kind of dark out and hazy out. And this is what happens, John 20. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb, and there were others with her, we know that, and they saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, that's John, by the way, he declines to put his name in there, and uh, the one Jesus loved and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So it's really significant that women are the first to actually see the risen Jesus. It's really significant. I think it's awesome. And, and so in the first century, women didn't have a lot of rights. They couldn't testify in court. They were viewed to have no credibility. 
uh, that way. In fact, if you were making up a story, you would never lead with that. If you were making this up, everybody would laugh at you. But why do they put it in? Because it actually happened. <laughs> it actually happened. So the women come to the, to the grave, and some of them rush back, so we don't know where the body is. They've stolen it. This is crazy. This is crazy. If you're making up the story, it would almost seem so unreliable at this point because they're not expecting a resurrection because Messiah's going to die. It's not like this. Hey, he said he'd be back to, back to life in three days. Let's have some, uh, let's have, make sure that we're all there at the tomb. Let's get ready. Let's have a countdown. Oh, maybe it's at seven in the morning, 10, nine. Hey, they're all getting ready for the resurrection. Nobody was there. They weren't selling tickets to it. There was no band. There was no parade. There was nothing because they never anticipated a resurrection. Caught them all off guard. They, they just didn't see it. They weren't there. Luke 24, after they had seen the risen Jesus, then they go back to the disciples, and it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, and Mary, the mother of James, and the others with them, who told this to the apostles. They said, hey, we, we, they're back and forth from the tomb to where they're at. And they say, hey, we saw him alive. But notice what the disciples said. But they did not believe the women because the words seemed like what? Nonsense. This is a crazy talk. A dead person in the tomb, the 2,000-pound rock is rolled away. The Roman soldiers who are SEAL Team 6 ran off. And you say you saw Jesus alive? They just went, this is just, this is dumb. This is just, they, they just can't get their arms around it. And then here's what happens next. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He's bragging. <laughs> Probably. Okay, so this is John. He bent over and looked in the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. You know why? You wouldn't go in a tomb either. <laughs> Scary. You know those movies where they dig a, dig a coffin out because they have to exhume it? Nobody wants to take the lid off first, right? It's kind of like John. He's like, I'm not going in, but not Simon Peter. Look at this, verse 6. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He just barges in. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. What's it say? He saw and believed. Thank you so much. The Apostle John had been walking around Jesus for three years. He didn't believe in the resurrection of Jesus until that very moment. And he walked in, and all of a sudden he goes, He's alive. And because he is alive, it confirms everything he told us, everything he said, everything we're trusting in and believing in as well. Some of you are right there. You're right there. You've been considering this. You've been kicking the tires. You've been thinking about it. How do I become a follower of Jesus? It's just like John. You believe in him. Number four, if you're taking notes, the disciples saw Jesus alive and began to tell everyone. This is so fascinating to me because they were cowards and now they can't stop talking about Jesus. Why? Because they saw him who was dead three days later alive. The resurrection. It's the game changer. Because if that's true then I can work through my doubts. I don't have to have all the questions answered to my doubts. But if the resurrection is true, my doubts about why my mom died, the doubts about this, the doubts about why my marriage failed, the doubts about that failed, the doubts about this and this and this. If this is true, I'm believing it to be true, then it kind of does an end run around those things because then their importance takes a little bit of a back seat. Does that make sense? So the disciples saw Jesus alive and they began to tell everybody. They went from cowards to the most courageous people in the world. And a few weeks later, not a long time, they went to the biggest 
crowd thing going on in Jerusalem called the Day of Pentecost, and thousands of people were there. And they started t- preaching in the open air. They had a four-point message. You want to know the four points? Here we go. They said to the people there, you killed him. God raised him from the dead, and he's alive. We saw it. Now say you're sorry. <laughs> and point four, believe in him. Yeah. You killed, because they were the ones that killed him. You killed him. But God raised him from the dead, and when he's alive, we saw him. Say you're sorry. That's repent. Change your mind about this and believe in him as the Savior. Thousands of people that very day believed in Jesus as their Savior as well. That was their four-point message. We went around telling everybody about the resurrection. If, think about this, think this through. It's very important. If a man can predict his own death and how he dies and then predict that he comes back to life, why wouldn't you go with what he says? Right? I'll go with what he says. And he says, if you believe in me, you will have eternal life and you can go to heaven. I've asked my uh, good friend Bob Renicky to come up. Bob is going to share his story, how he came to believe in Jesus. And um, uh, Bob is actually chairman of our board here at Grace. I asked him to come and share. Just give him a round of applause because he might be nervous. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> When I was six years old, I remember living in a trailer court out in Venita, and a neighbor kid who I was playing with that day asked me a very personal question. He asked if I was a Christian. I'm not sure why I even asked the question, but I do remember feeling really uncomfortable with his boldness. <clears throat> I remember answering yes, but, because I had a re- but not because I had a relationship with Jesus, but it was more that no seemed like I was saying I didn't believe in God, that I doubted his existence, or even worse, that I hated him. I do remember being proud of my moment of courage, but it was also a relief that my answer seemed to satisfy him. As I thought more, I wrestled with the question and thoughts raced through my mind, is being a Christian my choice? <clears throat> is, this, is this decided by me or my parents? Is the yes answer the only option besides siding with the devil? Um, saying yes seemed like the most log- logical choice given my upbringing, In those early years, living in that trailer court, my mom would occasionally uh, take me to a little local neighborhood church. I think we went maybe five or six times. I'm not sure even why we stopped going, but I suspect it was because the preacher was what my mom described as a hellfire and brimstone kind of a preacher. This was too much for my mom, who struggled with alcoholism, alcoholism her whole life. I also went with grandma to church a few times, but my God experience were very limited growing up. Looking back, I'd say a few seeds were planted, even though I can't remember much of it. I had a basic belief that there was a God, enough to answer yes to the six-year-old evangelist in my trailer court. Um, But growing up with an alcoholic mom, and I had to spend a lot of time outside. (laughs) Plus, it was the 70s, so that was somewhat the norm. I was exceptionally independent, having to rely on myself for some of the basic things, like getting myself to baseball practice and walking to school. I remember not wanting my friends to spend the night at my house because my mom was usually drunk and embarrassing to be around. One particular friend I hung out with a lot lived right next to a convenience store that his parents owned. I somewhat became the adopted child as I was allowed to hang out there as much as I want and got uh, free snacks, free video games, soda pop, and uh, through most of my younger years. When I was old enough to get my work permit, I I got paid to hang out at the store pumping gas, stocking shelves, and eating snacks while making $3.35 an hour. As I got older, I moved into my sophomore year in high school, and the job that I had at the store also gave me a little clout with some of my cooler friends at school. I had access to stuff as a teenager that a lot of kids didn't have. The free snacks and soda turned into free beer for the upcoming Friday night party. Towards the end of my sophomore year, I remember being invited to a youth event called Campus Life. I surprisingly jumped, in the, jumped at the chance to go because another activity uh, meant another evening away from home. Campus Life was different than anything I'd ever experienced. The staff seemed to really care about me. 
and they all seemed really excited to see me whenever I showed up. During those first few weeks, I remember attending, um, I remember being, there being an announcement of an upcoming summer camp to Big Sky, Montana. Everyone was so excited that I was, I was also caught up in the enthusiasm to go. I remember the camp cost about 250 bucks. <laughs> Surprisingly, my parents agreed that I could go, but I would have to raise the money myself. With only a few months left before camp, I knew I had to get creative. At first, I began to sell merchant, store merchandise at school, and I would pocket the cash. This uh, escalated to me taking money out of the till when nobody was looking. I had enough money to go, eventually, and even a few hundred extra dollars in my pocket um, for the road trip. On the way to Big Sky, <clears throat> I rode in the vans with my new friends, a pocket full of cash, and thought how strange it was to go from throwing a party at my friend Tony's house just two months earlier, where I had stolen several cases of beer, uh, to hanging out with some really different, yet kind of cool and happy to be alive type of people. <clears throat> I remember a few nights after we arrived at camp, things got a little serious when a few kids almost drowned going whitewater rafting. This made the fun trip a little more real. It was sometime during that week that I actually heard the gospel for the first time. I was brought back to my childhood when I, my six-year-old friend asked me, are you a Christian? Suddenly I'm asking myself, am I a Christian? Do I really have a relationship with God? The truthful answer this time was no. I certainly don't have the kind of relationship relationship with Jesus that these people seem to have. As I sat there on the wooden floor listening to the speaker, I could feel the question coming. Do I want to be a Christian? Do I want Jesus into my life? And do I want to have a relationship with him? As I listened, I had no doubt that my answer was yes. I was even a little confused as to why nobody had asked me this before, at least not in this way. That night, an invitation to accept Jesus was given. We were challenged to stand up if we wanted to accept him in our, into our hearts. I remember opening one eye during the prayer just to make sure I understood the challenge correctly. Uh, I sprung to my feet as soon as I saw another classmate stand up. It was okay being second, but I wasn't going to be last. I wanted God to know I was serious. I was super excited to start my new life and more excited that heaven was in my future until I got back from camp. For the return home, I was given a few challenges. I was told to tell three people that I had become a Christian. The first person I told was my mom. <clears throat> In spite of her challenges, I knew that she would be the most understanding and proud that I had made this decision. Shortly after I returned, the word was out. Bob was a Christian. Just a few months earlier, I was drinking beers with 30 of my so-called friends, and now I was born again. I, rem I remember being put to the test when my childhood best friend, Tony, who didn't go to camp, and was a partner in crime at the stealing of the beer, showed up my first day back at work and confronted me with a mocking comment. So, I hear you love the Lord's son. I stood my ground and told them that I was a Christian. As hard as the confrontation was, I, thought, I figured, hey, at least this counts as one of my three. <laughs> Campus life was pretty good at uh, helping young people get their new Christian walk off to a good, good start. My cabin leader, Rick, <clears throat> met with me weekly to do a Bible study and to pray for me. I remember one night after our study, Rick asked me to pray for him. Rick had worked at a butcher shop for, a few, for about 10 years, and in his first few years of working there, he had stolen a few packages of meat, a few steaks here and there. <clears throat> Rick felt guilty over the years and had been trying to square things up by skipping breaks, skipping lunch hours. But recently, Rick felt he needed to confess to his boss. He was asking for prayer, for courage to do so. Well, needless to say, the weight of this was overwhelming. I went home that night broken and scared, uh, wondering, was God telling me that I needed to confess also? But there was no way I'd be forgiven. This was way more than a few stakes. Uh, the next week in our study, I told Rick what I had done. Rick felt terrible that he had put this predicament on me. Uh, I think he even knew this was too much for a 16-year-old new believer to bear. I remember he simply prayed for me, no judgment, just prayer. I agonized for weeks about what to do. I rode my bicycle many times to the store to confess, only to pedal back, reasoning and pleading with God for another option. 
I hope that God would give me some sort of confirmation that this was just Satan's way of attacking me. That I had already been forgiven, and this was unnecessary. No matter how much I tried, though, to shake it, I couldn't get the conviction to go away. So I finally gave in. I surrendered to God and left it up to him to give me the courage. The day of a confession came suddenly. I was, back in the, I was in the back room counting bottle returns, and my boss was suddenly a few feet from me with nobody else around. I blurted out the words, Hey, Vince, I've got something to tell you. There was no turning back now. My boss, I have to say, was incredibly gracious. He's so gracious that I thought maybe he was a Christian, uh, even though he had never told me that. Uh, my boss not only gave me the opportunity to keep my job, but he also allowed me to work it off. He would prove to be one of the most forgiving guys I've ever met. His kindness was so undeserving and the best example I've ever experienced of what God's grace is like, getting complete forgiveness when it's not deserved. I had no idea at the time that God would use my story to impact others in my school. Uh, as a senior, I was asked to share my testimony in front of a bunch of other classmates, many of which were not Christians. They had actually advertised that evening uh, at school as me being the guest speaker. It was the only campus life event my friend Tony ever came to, um, just to add to the pressure. <laughs> and, uh, um, but I, I was able to share my testimony that night with many, many, many young people. I also saw teachers uh, start supporting the Campus Life organization because of, as one teacher put it, the difference it made in that Bob Renicky guy. <clears throat> I now know the impact of my friends on my friends and the community would have been much, much less if I was allowed to do things my way. God knew exactly what he was doing, even though I didn't make, it didn't make sense to me at the time. I spent the next 10 years serving and working at Campus Life, ministering and sharing the gospel with young people in, in that community. God gave me a heart that wanted to see other young people just like me come to know him. Kids like me who didn't even, who had never been asked the follow-up question to the, are you a Christian question, which was, do you want to be? I probably wasn't ready for the second question at six years old, but experiencing God's love through other people, that group of people that were so excited to see me every week, people that loved and accepted me and saw me through God's eyes was simply irresistible. This incredible life-changing event is what made me want to see other people just like me leap up from the floor and say, yes, I want Jesus in my life. Hey, thank, thanks, Bob. My story's a little bit like Bob's because I made that same decision as a teenager as well. And as I said at the beginning of the service, some of you have been considering this. You've been kind of window shopping, exploring. You've been kind of thinking about it. You say, well, yeah, I, I want to do that. How, how do I get there? Well, one way, can you throw the next slide for me? One way, a way is to simply express to God uh, that you believe in his son, Jesus. And so you can do that by prayer. We don't become Christians by praying. We become Christians by believing in Jesus and his resurrection. But a prayer is a way to express that. And if you look at the prayer on the screen, it simply says, Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus is your son, and I believe that he died for my sin. That's the part I talked about with that whole atonement thing. He takes your sin away. You don't have to buy a bird for that. I believe that Jesus rose from the dead. You believe in the resurrection. And at this very moment, I place all of my faith in his death on the cross as payment for my sin. In other words, instead of believing or trusting or depending upon yourself, you're going to believe and depend upon and trust in Jesus Christ in order that your sins are forgiven and that you can have eternal life and a real relationship with God. You can start today to be a follower of Jesus. So I'm going to ask that if everybody just close their eyes, bow their heads, just kind of have a quiet moment here in church and and if this prayer expresses the desire of your heart, I'm just going to read it out loud, and you can repeat it back to God. Just repeat it back to him silently. And here it is. Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus is your son. I believe that when he died, he died for my sin. I believe that he rose from the dead and was seen. And in this moment, I place all my faith in his death on the cross as payment for my sin. 
Come into my life. Welcome me to your family. I love you. I'm grateful. And I want to spend the rest of my life as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Hey, if you, if everyone could just take out this card and in a moment, we're going to pass a bucket around for our offering today. But more importantly, you can drop this card in and on the back side, it just has a place that says, I trusted Jesus for the first time today. And if that's you, let me know. As Bob said, tell three people. Well, you can tell me first. You can fill out the card, check that, and just let us know. And we can point you to some information and help you get started. Oh, and I also have, everybody get a sticker? Everybody get, so yeah, so I gotta explain this. Uh, it's on the screen here. So this is the Greek word for, uh, it, it says fish. And you pronounce it ichthus. Ichthus is how you pronounce it. it the f symbol of the fish was one of the uh, most prolific symbols that early Christians used. It's all over um, in archaeology, all over in, in the Middle East and so forth. And they used it as an acronym to mean something very significant. And I'm sharing this for those of you who need to reconnect with Jesus. So the first letter of the acronym, I, iota, it's, it's the first letter of the word Jesus in Greek, Jesus. And then the X is the CH sound, Christ. And the theta is the third letter. We get the word theos from that, and it means God. The fourth letter is, is that Y letter, and you pronounce that weos, and that means sun. And the last letter is the sigma, and it stands for soter, which means uh, savior. So the acronym meant this to early Christians, Jesus Christ, God's son, savior. At Easter, we need to really remember he is the savior. So here's my challenge to you. For those of you who have ghosted Jesus and you're not spending time with him, is to peel your sticker and stick it somewhere that you'll see it for the future. I stuck mine on my phone. I stuck mine in the middle of my wallet because I have two of them. If you didn't get a sticker, we got plenty of stickers, by the way, out in the atrium. But just take this and just think, today I reconnected with Jesus. And this ichthu symbol, Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior, the Lamb of God who takes away our sin. Happy Easter, everyone.
Revelation, we read that Jesus, uh, after the resurrection, that he is alive and seated at the right hand of the Father, reigning over heaven and earth. And the angels and the saints in glory sing hallelujah, and they sing holy, holy, holy. Day and night they sing the first song that we sang today, that we join the hosts of heaven singing holy. So today we're going to continue to do that as we join with the angels in singing hallelujah. The Lord God Almighty reigns. Holy, holy, holy.
sing Amen. Amen. The reign of darkness now is ended in the kingdom of light. In the kingdom of light. Forever under your dominion. You're the king of my life. You're the king of my life. You reign above it all. You reign above it all. Over the universe and over every heart. There is no higher name. Jesus, you reign. Just to give us new life Now from the lips of the 